welcome back to the next episode of podcasts. How does it feel to be a classical female musician? Where we speak about careers, challenges of being a woman in a classical music business, and general gender inequalities in the same industry. It is a series of podcasts with prominent female musicians. You can find out more about the project in the first video, which link I will leave in the description below. I'm very honored to introduce you my today co-speaker, Johanna Stimler, an amazing violinist from Hermida Quartet. Hello, Johanna. Hello, nice to meet you. You are a member of one of the leading quartets nowadays, Armida Quartet. In 2012, you won the first prize, the audience prize, and six further prizes at the International IRD competition in Munich. I assume that was one of the biggest milestones in your career, which opened many doors. How was the entrance to the professional world for you as a young and successful woman? Um, yeah, you know, um, let's start with the competition idea, maybe, um, because you are absolutely right. The um, 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 RD competition was a big milestone to our quartet, and it opened many doors, in fact. But um, if you see an award or a prize, it's um, most likely to be only the tip of the iceberg. And um, what was leading to this um, big success was um, more or less six years of rehearsing and um, giving concerts and preparing and um, more or less dedicating um, our whole life to a quartet, quartet playing. And um, I think um, this was the even bigger milestone to us because to achieve this, you have to really change your whole life. So to say playing string quartet is like a special way of living. And um, so this was kind of a longer process. In my personal um, situation, it also came together with the birth of our first son and um, with uh, getting married and with studying my solo instrument. So this was really um, a period of time um, with lots of new experiences and um, lots of challenges and uh, very exciting. So about being a woman, this was um, of course also very interesting. Our quartet is um, mixed. We have both, we have two boys and two girls. So two men, two uh, women. And um, it was very interesting to grow together as a group and, and to see uh, how our, our impact um, could be. And um, I think we found kind of perfect gender equality, I would say. Amazing. Um, as a member of Hermida Quartet, you performed in many world-renowned halls like Concertgebouw in Amsterdam, the Philharmonie Berlin, and Wigmore Hall in London. How would you describe the feeling when after years of practicing, improving and disclaiming, you stand on the big stage you always dreamed about? Yeah, of course, this feeling is overwhelming. And um, it, yeah, you know, it feels, um, it gives you a certain kind of proud to, to stand in this big tradition of music making. And it's a wonderful thing to, to make music in front of a listening crowd of like-minded people. Um, this is something wonderful. And I always did and still doing it with all my passion and all, um, all my love and energy. But still, I think um, playing in those halls should be your result, not the intended goal. You see, it was never like, um, like my goal is to, to go to Wigmore Hall. Of course, it's wonderful. It's the most amazing thing. <laughs> but uh, um, the, uh, the goal always was, uh, or the intention always was to um, come to um, as close as possible to, to one uh, artistic ideal. <laughs> and uh, I think um, once you are on this track, um, playing in those wonderful halls of music, um, is the result and um, not some, uh, something you are aiming on in the first step. But probably maybe, you, I mean, of course, it shouldn't be a goal like that, but probably you wished for it before when you, when you were in the whole process of it. I'm sure that you dreamed sometimes about the big stages and crowded um, audience. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, and I think it has to be something like this, that you, you need this kind of um, imagination and, um, you know, um, uh, dreaming of the future and picturing yourself in, into the future. Um, but um, the actual work is uh, super little steps, so step by step. And, and in this process of little steps, you don't think about the big hole every day. You always think about what's the next step to, to do. And um, I think that uh, um, thinking about the big hole can also uh, kind of limit yourself because it blocks you maybe. Um, so kind of differs which kind of person you are, of course. But um, I always feel like, both is important, thinking of the big result and also doing the small steps. Yeah, for me, for example, I'm coming from Slovenia, so it's a really little country with this two million population and the culture is not so strong there. So like it was always a wish to play in the big holes, but it kind of seemed impossible. And then when I had my uh, first concert with orchestra in Hamburg in Philharmonie, I remember like I didn't actually had it as a goal because I thought, okay, I'm from a small country. I probably won't make it. Um, but I almost cried because I was so happy and my heart was so full that I just could stand on the stage and not being in the audience as I thought maybe before I will be. And, and this feeling of, I don't know, uh, warming your heart and all the emotions which come out um i can say it's really amazing and if you stand in the big stages with a quartet i can imagine it's like even hundreds times bigger because there is less people and you really kind of feel after not on the stage of course but you see how much you worked and how much uh disclaiming was behind to come where you are. I think it's a big step when you really realize, okay, my work was actually seen and worth, let's say like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, since you all already said that your quartet consists of two men and two women, could you say you felt any differences in the way your achievements and work were looked at between you and your male colleagues. Um, I don't think between you um, in the quartet, but from other people, for example, after the concerts, in the interviews, or in the emails, for example. I have to say, um, to be very honest, I consider myself very lucky to have uh, had bad experiences about it. So I, I never felt like people would judge my professional appearance or my um, performance on stage differently just because I'm a woman. So this is thankfully something uh, we didn't have to witness, but we saw the phenomenon that father and the mother are judged differently from uh, people from the audience or sometimes even from pro promoters because we have direct comparison, right? So my, my husband is in the quarter two and me, of course, and we, we have our son. And um, when we started career as a string quartet, um, our son was very little. And I kind of regularly got comments on that, like how I don't see my child enough and how I can make this happen and things like that. And my husband didn't. So this was kind of gender equality um, too. I guess, and this, of course, didn't bother me personally that much um, because the people didn't know me. And, you know, I, I was uh, sure about uh, doing the right thing and my kid was in the right hands and everything was a lucky thing. It could happen like this. But still, it reflects on how we think about mothers and fathers and um, how they should act or not act in musical business. Exactly. Um, I mean, we will also have this question later, but just because I'm curious how to balance everything. But let's be honest, male never get a question how you balance your family and career, but not because they don't balance it, just because it's kind of in the world normal that men shouldn't be so much there for a family like women should be. And so we are like, yeah, it's okay for a guy that he have a big career and he's not at home, but women, no, 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 that, that doesn't go together. She needs to be at home. She needs to be all the time with the child and everything. And actually, let's be honest, the best possibility is when you mix everything well together and you find a good balance 
that both parents are in up with the child. So it's kind of a bit stupid direction which people always go. But I hope it will also change slowly because I think fathers are doing great job and slowly they also change the mind of other people that they can be very um, active in the growing up of the children. But you said that you got your first son actually kind of in the beginning of the big career of the quartet. It's kind of rare that women have a child at that point, let's say um, in the beginning of the of the big career. So I'm even more curious, how did you handle it? Because normally or they have it earlier or later. So the career is kind of between. But I think it can be a big motivation and help to other girls who maybe want family earlier to see that it's actually possible. Um, yeah, you know. Our um, our son was absolutely intended, so we really wish for it. It was like a big intuition thing, um, and I was we both were still in our studies, and um, not in the end. It was like actually the middle of our studies, and um, there was no other um, woman around me uh, getting pregnant. I was literally the only one <laughs> in the complete university having uh, a baby, and this was of course I, I sometimes I felt like an alien or something like this um but to us it was um the perfect timing <laughs> because um our son got birth um one year before our first very big international competition which was geneva competition and the following year there was the rd competition so when we won rd our son was two years old and um i have to say it with the um in the same second um all of this wouldn't have been possible without our families. So this is something I really have to underline, just wouldn't have been possible without our families because they were supporting us, um, not only um, with their thinking and how they are living and how they are, think about working and having family and so on, but also with lots of their time. So they would uh, spend hours and days and weeks um, and traveling together with us, coming with us to the concerts and taking f uh, care for the baby and taking care for the baby while we have to rehearse. It's not only concerts, yeah? When you are starting um, string quartet, you have to rehearse like hell. <laughs> so um, our son was growing up very closely to his grandparents, both of them, which is great for him. And he's got very close bonding with, with his um, grandparents and also it's nice for the family because everyone gets closer together, but um, I'm totally aware this is not possible for all young women. So um, I think there's really uh, lots of things have to be changed to um, make it possible for young women to have their children when they feel like they want to have them and not when society gives them a chance, so to say, right? So. Um, without my parents, um, there wouldn't have been the chance to have both. And I would have uh, to decide myself. And um, that's kind of a pity because I think that's um, not the way it should be or it, um, uh, it's intended to be maybe even. Um, exactly. Yes. Um, so I would wish um, for even more of those programs, um, even at universities, which, um, you know, encourage women to think about it even most of them just don't think about it because they think it's not possible <laughs> but yeah. I think being a mom it's a wonderful thing and it um in a special way it even helped me as a um, musician it helped me growing it helped me find confidence it helped me finding a place in my life and it brought so many uh, new experiences and ideas and love to life <laughs> that um it changed a lot in my playing actually and in my a way of working in a group too so um this is something i wish for every young woman to happen that's amazing and thank you so much for sharing that with us because i think it can really help to many girls to see that everything is possible if we organize well if we really wish it if we have right people next to us and i'm really glad that stories like that exist and have a happy happy end but as you already said your quartet started when you still were on the college and actually it exists already 16 years 
And many of us are dreaming to find a fixed chamber group which won't fall apart in two years or one year, how it normally happens in the university when you have a quartet or trio. Um, but in the real life, it's sometimes really hard to find people who have similar musical ideas, similar goals, pass well together with characters, and at the end, live in the same city. So. Um, what would you as an experienced uh, quartet player say it's a key which keeps the ensemble together? And what are the things we should be careful about when we are looking for people for an ensemble? Yeah, unfortunately, I have to say there is no key. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Um, um, like uh, most of this um, complex questions in life, there is no really one key you can just follow and then it's gonna work out perfect. Um, of course, it's got to do with luck too. Um, um, like with all yeah, connections with people in life or how you relate with other people, it's also um, connected with uh, good timing and, and meet the person. <laughs> um, so this is, um, I was kind of uh, lucky here too, but um, there are some factors maybe we could think about I, I think um, being aware uh, of a good communication um, helps a lot. So um, uh, playing in an ensemble is um, mostly about communication, <laughs> um, verbal or non-verbal. And um, I think you have to be aware of, of this fact. So if you, <laughs> not, if you are not a freak about communication, you, you are probably not in the right um, <laughs> situation <laughs> in um, ensemble. Um, but this is true for any teamwork in life, of course. The other thing, maybe um, it helps to be okay with changes. So um, I've had other groups too, which didn't work out. So it's, it's total, it's kind of normal that you try it and it doesn't work out. But um, once you have the feeling this could probably work out, <laughs> um, then um, it's... Uh, kind of necessary to be aware of the fact that things are going to change permanently. So I, I think uh, being flexible helps a lot, being flexible um, towards how you structure things, but all, also towards communication and towards the things you expect from one in, uh, each other and things like that. Being flexible in both internal and external ways helps a lot, I think. Um, and now when you said communication, I, I just got a question in my head and it's like, for example, it can happen that you find a great group, but maybe one of the members doesn't pass so good together with others. And here is again communication, how to say to this person, I mean, what to do in this case, I can imagine that for the quartet or for whatever group is, can should be the best to change this one person which maybe don't fit at all with the wishes or character or whatever or it's hard to communicate but do you have any like advices how to communicate because i think it's a really tough thing to do if you don't if the whole group doesn't pass together it's of course way easier but if there is just for example one person then I can imagine myself in this position when I should say something like that and I would feel so uncomfortable and wouldn't know actually how to do it. So do you have maybe any suggestions for people who, who find themselves in situations like that? Um, yeah, I guess um, there's no other way than being honest. Um, and um, if the one person that doesn't fit that well feels the same, um, then it's not going to be a problem because then maybe it helps um, being honest about um, the thing and um, uh, there's only two possibilities. Either you find a way to make things improve or um, um, the person feels the same and uh, will say, okay, I, I have to find another group that just doesn't fit that well but if the person doesn't feel the same then it's going to be <laughs> a, a little bit more complicated and and here's where the trouble starts but um you know um a good communication includes um the fact that things are not always easy and not always comfortable 
and uh, sometimes um, a group even learns and grows from a person that doesn't fit <laughs> you see what I mean so um, yeah. I'm, I'm uh, going to a point where I say um, you don't have to fit from the beginning like 100% maybe um, you only fit for 50% and you can work on on the rest and maybe that makes you even more interesting and even more diverse and creative um, if you uh, stick to these um, problems which maybe turn out to be a, a big big uh, chance for your group so after this actually I I, I would say that the biggest thing is that we we always give our best to work what, with what we have but this person who maybe doesn't fit it's also important that he or she has a wish to change to pass better of course and then maybe at the end yeah as you said we all learn something great from it and at the end we get an amazing group which works really really well together I would like to jump now a bit to the orchestra um, themes. And in the previous century, the situation for professional female musicians was extremely hard. And it took us ages to get an opportunity to be a part of professional orchestras. As we all know, the most conservative orchestra regarding this theme was Vienna Philharmonic, which accepted the first woman as an instrumentalist after social pressure in 1997. So actually after I was born, which is pretty shocking. Um, young generations would think this period is completely over, but I took a look to the leading positions in two leading orchestras in Berlin. So to Berliner Philharmoniker and Staatskapelle Berlin. And I need to admit that the number of 82.56% of men in the leading positions kind of shocked me. Um, what is your point of view about a large number of men in the leading positions in orchestras, especially in Austria and Germany? Because, for example, in France, the situation is much better. Yeah, first of all, I have to say I'm aware of the fact that uh, things are already changing and they need time for this so um, we are talking about not only season per season but if you uh, get a, a job like a concert master you're a concert master for the rest of your life until you are getting retired so of course we can't change those things within uh, two or three or uh, even ten years it uh, needs more time for those things to change and um, this is one thing so um, if you look um, onto the numbers of um, let's say um, the musicians under the age of 45, it's going to be uh, already different, right? Yeah. So um, I guess in, in my generation, um, the um, um, percentage of leading female um, musicians has already changed. Um, still, um, of course, I'm also aware that there are um, uh, things that are blocking the process maybe a little bit. And um, this is um, kind of got to do with our thinking. And I mean, all of us, not only the men, right? It's all, also, I mean, it's about um, how we think a woman should behave or act as a musician. And it's about um, how we train our children in the process of becoming a musician. So I, I think the problem is not uh, on the day of the Probespiel <laughs> of the audition. I think the problem uh, goes back to, to the first years when you start your instrument. And, and they go on in the universities as well. So um, I feel like we um, don't encourage women enough in an early stage to become leaders if they feel like it, if they wish <laughs> for you. Do, not everyone has to be a leader. <laughs> um, so this is uh, one very important thing, I guess we, we should all think about. And, and, and me, myself, and I, I consider myself a kind of reflective person, still um, I find myself sometimes uh, thinking things like, um, uh, yeah, is she the right person? Or, or you know, um, we have all things like this in our heads. So um, I think there's mentally, there has to be a transfer or change in the society. And this is, of course, not only restricted for the classical music business it's everywhere it's like for all of us it's kind of still in our system that a woman is the caring part and the man is the working part so to say and this is also reflects on the leadership thing 
And this is why it needs more time too, because it starts so early, our mental um, behavior in this matter. I think this, this is probably the most um, important thing. And uh, another thing is I kind of observe that in a daily life situation, uh, being a woman or man uh, as a musician doesn't matter that much. But in the moment um, a woman gets pregnant, um, so follow, uh, follows her natural way, being a woman, then it's uh, getting complicated. And that's uh, what shouldn't be, because a woman, of course, can't change the fact that she's the one getting pregnant and not the man. <laughs> but, exactly. <laughs> so the, Maybe you would the, like to change that, but unfortunately, <laughs> yes. it's impossible. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So you're getting my point here. I think there need to be more structures um, to uh, not reflect the uh, responsibility and um, all the time spent in uh, giving birth and, and, and bre breastfeeding your child and all the stuff on your um, personal, professional way of living. And this is uh, still a problem. So I know the stories of orchestra um, player. Once they get pregnant, they get comments on how they uh, are not enough in the concert or it's bad for the group that they <laughs> have to stay at home for one year, let's say. And um, the others will have to um, play more because they are leaving for maternity. And this kind of makes the teamwork bad, of course. And, and it doesn't help for the woman to find the right timing and find the right decision about getting pregnant or giving birth and all the stuff. So um, I think there has to be a shift in, in this direction too. Exactly. I think that was, I didn't even think like that about it because I always knew as a musician it's a hard time kind of to find the, the 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 timing for having a baby but let's be honest it's whatever you do it's a hard timing but we study kind of long and then we have this process of probespiel and everything which you never know how long will will it uh, takes and then you need a job and then you need to pass the trial time and then you are new in the orchestra and you shouldn't have a baby. So it's, I think, as you said before, like when you wish for it, you kind of should go it because more than I think about when is the right time, more I see the right time is when I'm like 45 or something, but that's not the right time for my body. So um, maybe we actually started to overthink about it and try to, to fit well to the world nowadays but maybe it's not the completely best idea um but you also played uh, in leading positions in various chamber orchestras how did it feel for you as a young woman to lead the group full of older and more experienced colleagues well um again i'm i'm very lucky to haven't had any um bad experience here um, at all maybe it was because I, I was never long enough to really dive in, into the system so um, when I would play as a leader in a group of an orchestra it would be always as a guest so that kind of is a different of course and I witnessed the, the fact that people in orchestras are mostly very very open to new things and um, to also new ideas of leading which I find very interesting myself. So I, I think the idea of leading in an orchestra position has changed already and is still in the process of getting more open to the whole group's so responsibility of leading is not only um, on the side of the person leading, but it's also um, about the others helping to follow. And, you know, there's an active way to follow and to support a leader, which makes the leader kind of less a leader <laughs> and it makes it more more or less one group with someone sitting uh, at the top but you know it doesn't matter so I guess in very very good orchestras the the awareness of um, um, not giving the responsibility to only one person in the front um, is very well, let's say uh, already grown and I, I love this direction, I, as me as a chamber musician, uh, where uh, it's so important that everyone gives the same energy. I think the, the same works for orchestras as well. And in 
the way we communicate with each other like when we talk in rehearsals and so on i think there's already so much change that uh, it's uh, not kind of odd uh, for a woman to speak up or some things like that I, I i never saw something like this happen and i think this is an achievement we should um <laughs> keep of course and again it's connected about um with the way we are thinking of ourselves so when i was a, a very young musician so still in my studies i would always think about i wouldn't like to speak up because of my voice because i always say like my voice is too high you know <laughs> but i i saw people who really have something to say they have a low voice and they speak very you know very um male <laughs> and i always said like I, I, if i don't have this voice I, I, they, people won't listen um, but this is something in my head. So I came to a point where, where I could change this, let's say, mental disease, because it's it's not true. It's just not true. If you really have something to say, say it. And um, if people don't listen, then it's their problem <laughs> and not um, exactly. mine. So this is something we as women can try to consider as well. Yeah, I think this, what you said, that it also is how we stand for ourselves and how we come to the group, how approach exactly. It's very important because I know for a story when one young cellist uh, win an, um, an a solo position in a really good orchestra, but she was like really tiny. She had a lot of experience as a solist in the, in the big competitions, but she had no experience as an orchestra musician. And she was kind of very afraid of the position she was like I didn't even expect it to win and then it just happened and I just came there and I wanted to do something but then I got a group of lions be behind me who didn't want to hear my opinion who didn't like she said that she couldn't find a way to lead them because she always had a feeling that they kind of don't want to be led by her so at the end everything finished in one year um and she realized that she don't like so much orchestra and so on but but i think that exactly this also can help us if we have this approach i had one co-speaker who's also on the solo position and she won it when in the orchestra was almost no women on the solo positions and she told me that she never i mean she always has this approach because she was raised by mom who was really hard working on the good position and of course dad was working too but dad wasn't the big boss like it was before in the families and she was raised like she's really strong and she can do everything so she kind of came with this approach and it resulted that she didn't have any problems at the end with being a leader that everybody respected her and also if someone gave some, let's say, not appropriate comments, she knew how to stand for herself. She knew who she is and how much she's worth. So I think it's a really important thing, as you said, for example, that you didn't want to speak before because you think your voice is too high. And then with being a bit wiser, you realize that you should speak out. I think it's a very good example for all of us that we need to stand behind us. And if we are scared about lead, if you are scared about say something, then we kind of can't expect that other people will, will take us very seriously because if you come with a fear, then, I mean, as we said before, everyone can be a leader and um, to be a leader, you kind of shouldn't have this fear, maybe in the beginning, of course, because you're new and everything. But um, in general, I think you really need to stand behind your quality and behind yourself and also act like that and show to people you are aware of all your qualities so they can't kind of mess up with you, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the example of your co-speaker um, also underlines the idea that we really have to think about how we raise our um, children, especially if they are girls. And I too had the wonderful experience of a childhood where there was no difference between boys and girls in our family. So it would have been very equal and, you know, I always had very good support in this um, regards. But still, if one of you... Uh, 
and didn't have this great surroundings in your childhood, it's and not too late because you can start to support yourself like you would have wished for as a as a little girl, let's say. I think because we continue on uh, treating ourselves like how our parents would have done in our childhood. Exactly. And I think this is very important to to find those ideas in your head where it says a woman has to be like mm -hmm, or um, a career has to be like mm -hmm. we all have those sentences in our head and it's very worthy to go through them and ask yourself whether this is really right or whether you would like to change something about it and um, sometimes changing those sentences in your head helps to see changes in your life. I think that's where everything started because in your head normally started all the good and the bad things which then reflected to your life. So this is one of the points we also should to remember for sure. And I think even, of course, some of us, we had luck and really were raised in the families, like you said, where we get kind of good example and good push to, to do whatever we want in the life. But also when we go to the universities, I was kind of, I don't know how it happened, but first I had my mom who is really strong a woman with like, she always worked a lot and was always very successful. And then in the conservatory, I got an amazing female cello teacher. And then in the Hochschule, I got another female cello teacher. And then later one more female cello teacher. So I actually was always led by a woman and I just realized that I have kind of really little ideas how it is to work with a male professor, for example, because I had it very shortly between. So I think we can find also much motivation, many motiv much motivation for, for changing the things in the head, observing the people around us, which we admire, for example. And university, I think, is a really good thing to do it. And You actually started your professorship now um, in October at the UDK Berlin, so congratulations for that. It's an amazing success. Um, and But actually in Germany, the number of female professors is still very low, um, which is also the main reason why this Frauenförder Stipendium exists. And this interview um, takes part as my final project for this scholarship. Um, so how was your experience in auditioning for a professorship? Of course, we know that you did it successfully, but did you maybe with conversation with some of your female colleagues um, got any impression that they had the harder auditioning process or maybe they are judged because of the gender or appearance or something like that? Well, I haven't heard about such a thing. What I'm observing is that people who are building up the um, audition in those kinds of Lehrprobe, um, I mean, the people who are judging applications, they are um, not equally um, divided into male and female. So um, mostly um, there is a, a percentage, let's say, of at least 70% um, male jury members and 30% female, at least. Most of the time, it, I felt like it's even more um, on, the, on the male side. Um, so I think here's some natural, <laughs> it's not in the right balance. Yeah, obviously. And I think that should be different. Of course, um, universities are changing their um, since years already, uh, changing their uh, process in, uh, in the way that they really ask for women to apply and they have something like a Frauenquote in the application, so they have to at least invite, I don't know exactly the number of the percentage, but they mm -hmm. do have to invite women to the Lehrprobe. And I think also in the decision process, there's always a Frauenbeauftragte in the group who, who talks about whether or not it should be this or another candidate. So I think uh, the structure is already in kind of a right direction. 
I feel like there are differences in the instrumentations as well. So um, there are kind of very female instruments, for example, violin. Um, <laughs> exactly. I would guess there are probably more violin professors that are female than male. I mean, I would have to look it up. I, but I feel like this percentage is different for violin teachers only, if you look at it, or maybe let's say harp or something like this. Yeah, I think there is a change in between the instruments here. But still, um, you see it also if you look at soloists that are invited to um, orchestras. So um, there's a report of the Deutsche Kulturrat where they look to, through all the programs in, in the symphony orchestras and music halls in Germany. And they found out that even in those instruments where you would think it's more or less a female instrument, like violin or harp, the soloist invited would be more often um, a male one than a female one. Obviously, a certain kind of thing going on that the higher uh, level you get, the more likely it is you have a success as a male human being. So I think here is um, still a lot to do. And um, I'm not sure whether this is um, only because of our social structure, or maybe it's also, again, connected with our mental structure, <laughs> so to say, right? So um, I feel like women don't see themselves often enough in a position of being professor. This little tiny kind of funny example with my voice was only like a super small uh, puzzle of, of this big picture of how women see themselves not being the right ones. <laughs> and I think this is where we uh, have to change. We all as a society to make both women and men being possible to imagine themselves in higher positions, uh, whether it is a professorship or a leader in an orchestra or a soloist or whatever. Um, I think this is um, all connected with each other. Exactly. But I think this mental thing and the way how we raise our children and how the education system works, I think it's a very important thing that we just start to think differently because it's kind of the easiest way to start making a difference is to start with yourself mm -hmm. or at least to speak about it and people who want to be leaders or who feels like that, women can start to change their minds to work on their mental approaches and i think that's a very important thing and it's not all about the system it's also a lot about us ourselves so i think we had a really interesting conversation and i think we made some really good points for young women to think about would you have any finishing sentence for for girls who dare to dream about big careers? Yes, I mean, <laughs> dreaming is always the first step, so stick um, to your dream and try maybe find um, a connection to your intuition. Um, but intuition is not always the first loudest voice in your head. Um, intuition is that what comes if you step back, back from your ego. And um, if you become quiet and, and listen to, to the sometimes a little um, less louder voice in your head, um, then you probably get a connection with your intuition. And um, I think, especially we women, we are very strong about this. And I, I think we are not always daring to use this kind of connection. And we, I think we should, and we should help one another. So that's what um, I like about those things like today, when we talk about those things, when we connect with each other, when we reach out for each other. And um, me too, um, I was part of some kind of project like you are just doing. So I also had something like a stipendium, which made um, things easier and helped me to work on my ideas and on my creative way. And I think this is very important because a woman's life, not always in the very straight line. <laughs> and, exactly. And, and I think it, it shouldn't be. And I, I think we should look out for more possibilities of making life work for women in a very individual way. 
and we don't feel like we have to fit in a certain rule or a certain way of doing things. I think it should be possible um, for women to express their own ideal of um, making their life work. And I'm very looking forward to, to see many, many uh, very different uh, ideas on how to create and um, follow your dreams. Thank you very much, Johanna, for your amazing and wise words. I was really honored to have you as my co-speaker, and I think we all learned some really important things from you. So thank you a lot for that, and I wish you a lot of success on your future career. Good luck with everything. Thank you. My pleasure, and all the best to you and all your listeners as well. Thank you very much.